continue where we left off last time with the list of supplements that people overuse and supplements that people underuse. I think that this is such a huge area and that's why it's taking us so long to really cover because people don't really understand which supplements are safe and which supplements are not safe. And there's all this propaganda out there about, oh, use this supplement. This is the best thing on earth. And then people start to think, well, I need massive amounts of whatever supplement that is. And it starts being used in ways that we've never used before. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, a study comes out maybe one study versus six studies that shows a problem with a supplement and before you know it everyone becomes phobic of using it. So that is part of the reason why this is such an extensive topic for us. Uh, yeah, and a lot of times it really does come back to um, not really understanding what the supplements do, not using them in a way that's just helping the body function or helping the body heal itself. Sometimes when um, supplements um, are looked at like medications because pharmaceuticals work by really um, trying to force some action onto the body. Um, supplements really shouldn't be used that way. They're there to give the body nutrients that it needs to do something or herbals can be used to uh, gently stimulate certain pathways. They're not there to like violently force an action onto the body but you know when people start thinking that's what they are intended to do or they start taking massive doses of something to try to force an effect on the body, that's where you start running into problems. Absolutely. So to get back to the supplements that people have used, we were going to talk about things like echinacea. Now echinacea is used to slowly build the immune system over time to help prevent things like colds and flus and other things like that. It's really not effective in the short term. So if you start, if you have a cold or something right now and you run off to the health food store and you buy echinacea and take massive amounts of it, that's not really what it's intended to do. And honestly, it doesn't really work for those type of things. So here you are taking all of this echinacea and you wonder why you're not getting better. Yeah, and this apparently started like in the 80s. It was never a traditional use of echinacea to use it um, short term for acute colds. That was something that was made up based upon some um, theory of how the immune system works because, you know, it stimulates production of white blood cells. So someone theorized that it was its use and then came all this promotion. Its traditional use is different. It's for um, you know, toxicity, sluggishness of the lymphatics. It was originally started off um, for like snake bites or really more toxic problems, chronic issues, not really intended um, at all for acute cold. And, you know, there are better ways to treat an acute cold than to run out and take mega doses of echinacea. And then that's the other part with echinacea because it's not really an acute cold remedy then you start, you'll see people taking huge amounts of it. You get tincture. I, I, I once remember one seminar was that, and a, a practitioner was there basically swallowing like tablespoons of echinacea from a bottle for an acute cold. And it's like, that's, <laughs> that's not really what you should do. There are, there are better things. Absolutely. And something similar to echinacea that I often see people abuse are things like mushroom complex, things like mataki mushrooms. Because people hear that mushrooms boost the immune system. Well, if you have an active cold right now, they're not going to do anything to treat the cold. They will in the long term boost your immune system along with other things, but they're not active right away. They take a long period of time to really work. So taking them proactively is fine, but going out and getting a mushroom complex and taking six or eight pills of them a day isn't really effective. It's just not working. Yeah. 
And, you know, part of this seems to be that our cultural mindset to fight against the problem, where if someone has a cold and the idea is what can you take to stop it? But, you know, at, that, at the actual, when it gets to the point where someone is producing a cold and, you know, they have all that mucus coming up or they have a sore throat, you, the only thing you can really do is help support the body in working through the problem. If you take mega doses of something to shut down that process, at that point what you would be doing is actually shutting down the body's self-healing um, mechanisms. Uh, because at that point what happens is there is so much infectious agent in the body that the body has to produce those symptoms in order to move the stuff out. So you want to do gentle treatments that help the body, you know, through that process. So, you know, even very commonly known herbs like garlic, for example, that's maybe the type of thing that will help the body move things out, or some physical treatments like a neti pot, for example, help move things out and support the body through that situation. Um, to go through another, to just exemplify the point, if someone were to take antibiotics for a sore throat, it can you know, maybe get rid of symptoms, but it would actually just trap things in the body and make them sick in the long run. So really looking for an herb that's just going to suddenly shut down on um, these immune system reactions, that, that's not what you want to do. And even if an herb did it, it probably wouldn't be the healthiest one way to go about things. Absolutely. And if someone is having a cold and they're having a lot of form of mucus, one of the best things they can do in addition to the neti pot, is cut out dairy from their diet. Dairy is extremely mucus-forming. And dairy is a lot of things that people don't realize. Yes, dairy is yogurt, cheese, milk, ice cream. All of these things are actually dairy. A lot of people, I'll tell them, will cut out dairy and you'll feel a lot better. And they're like, oh, can I still have yogurt? Well, no, yogurt is exactly dairy. That's one of the things that you need to cut out to reduce the mucus. And something else that's really good that people have a really good response to if they can't do the netting pot is something called wet socks, which is a form of physical medicine where you warm up your feet in warm, hot water. Then you take a pair of basically cold, wet socks, put them on, put on another pair of socks, and then go to bed. And that's very effective for getting rid of mucus. Uh, yeah, with, that's an old nature path of treatment, and it sounds kind of crazy, but what happens is the um, brain recognizes that the feet are cold, so it moves blood down there, and then the blood warms the feet. And this is how it forth over the night, but every time that happens, where you have this vasodilation and constriction of the feet, the reverse happens up in the upper respiratory um, part of the body. So we have vasodilation or expansion of the blood vessels followed by constriction, and this really moves the blood and lymphatics, you know, I mean, it gets those moving so you start clearing debris out of that area, and that helps, and that's probably the fastest way that I know of to really clear, like head cold, but it's also not suppressing anything. It's actually helping the body, you know, work through the problem. Exactly. One of the number one things when it comes to treating a cold is to remember you don't want to actually suppress the symptoms. You want to help the body to work through them. For example, if someone has a fever, if it's a mild fever, that's not something that you necessarily need to suppress or want to suppress. Because a fever is the body's way of fighting off the infection. And I see a lot of people who ask me, well, what can I take to bring down my fever? It's 101. And I tell them, well, you don't actually want to bring that down because the body is defending itself. Uh, yeah, traditionally, you actually want to do things to raise it. Like, obviously, if you have a 104 or 105 degree fever, you don't want to raise it. But, like, um, traditionally, uh, naturopathy, like a 101 degree fever, it's like, how do we help that to help the body work through the problem? Absolutely. So I think it's a good idea if we talk about some supplements that people underuse because that's also an issue in addition to all this overuse of supplements. And something that I personally see a lot of people terrified to use is kava. And kava is very good to help people relax. It's very good to help with pain. It's very good to help with anxiety. 
it's good to help with insomnia, and I've had really good results with this. But a lot of people are afraid to take it because there was one study that was done that showed that Cabo led to liver damage. But on investigation on the study, it basically the extract was extracted in something called hexane, which is pretty toxic to the liver. So all these other studies show it's fine, but one study show it's not good. Okay. Yeah, but you go online, just type in kava or dangerous herbs, and it's going to come up all over the place that it's cool, make people have to get liver transplants, and you read the scariest stuff about it, but all that comes from one flawed study, basically. Exactly, and that's what people need to understand, is that the studies that show that something is safe, they're not promoted. But the studies, no matter how poorly done they are, that show that something is dangerous, those are the ones that have the most propaganda. So yeah. if something and is out there and it's... You can continue. I was going to say, if something is out there and it's the same thing over and over again, I would do more research to try to figure out why is this particular study the only one that's being promoted. Look for other studies that show that something is dangerous. If you can't find any of those studies, then I would start looking at studies that show that something is safe because all of a sudden you'll find more and more of these safe studies. Yeah, and, you know, in the world of, you know, herbals, just because there's a study on something, that also does not mean that study um, respected either the traditional use of the herb or how the, an herb is traditionally prepared. You know, so uh, if someone could be doing something completely new or different with an herb, a dangerous preparation, for example, using it in, you know, not traditional doses, and you can start getting... Um, you know, weird results that have nothing to do with that urban clinical practice. Or That's absolutely true. And I think that Kava really is one of the best examples of that because of the fact that it was one study that showed that it was dangerous. And if you really look into the study, you realize it wasn't the Kava, it was how they made the Kava. They never would have made it that way in traditional cultures that use it. Yeah, no one's going to make a herbal extract and was hexane. Like, you know, you kind of wonder where did they even come up with the stuff from um, to do that. Of course, that's also part of like so getting to the biochemical models of you're going to extract this part of the plant or that, get to the active ingredient, and that's not really how herbs work. Exactly. In most of the herbs, it's we really don't know how they work. They theorize that it's one in one object that works. And that may be a part of the herb that has the most benefit, but in most herbs, it's many of the components, even trace elements that we haven't even found yet that are active. And if you just take one part of the herb, you're not getting the other benefit. And who knows how that one part of the herb acts when it's in isolation. Because you have, what people need to realize is that these things that are used by traditional cultures are used in a whole herb form. They're used in things called decoctions. They're used in tinctures. And they're even used in teas. They're not going into a lab somewhere and taking an herb and extracting the one active ingredient that they want. Yeah, and, you know, we have in this um, in the world of research a lot of just blatantly unscientific assumptions, and that is that these disease processes not only are only happening in certain localized areas and it's not the entire body that's affected, but then they'll take an herb and just as an assumption, they'll assume this herb has a active ingredient and it's that one thing and then they'll come up with theories based upon the active ingredient when there's no basis for that. It's the entire plant working. And something that I would add to the list of underused herbs, which has gotten a bit slapped with a dangerous label, is red clover. And it was just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a client and I mentioned red clover. 
and she tells me, oh, no, that's dangerous because she had endometriosis. Then, then you do some research online, and you see all these people talking about how red clover is dangerous because it's estrogenic. When you, I, I couldn't even find a study showing that there's a danger behind red clover. This is, was all based upon theory because red clover has phytoestrogens in it, which, by the way, um, if you're scared of phytoestrogens, you don't have a problem because not just many herbs have phytoestrogens, but they're all over nature. With lots of plants, you would be very hard to avoid them. So because it has some phytoestrogens in it, someone theorized that this is going to make things like breast cancer or endometriosis dangerous, and then you get all these warnings. But unlike the Kava study, which you can say, well, that was at least based upon a study as flawed as it, as it was, with red clover, this is just theorized. And um, the ironic thing is that red clover is a lymphatic herb, and it's really good for um, illnesses where there is stagnation of in the lymphatics, of detoxification, where, where there are cysts, um, an example. So a lot of female problems, it's been helpful because um, those are related to lymphatic congestion. But nonetheless, besides there's full this theory online about how it's dangerous, but then you also see in the world of research, all, all this work has been done in terms of red clover to figure out um, how it helps women based upon its estrogenic activity, which, again, has nothing to do whatsoever with its traditional use as a mild detoxifying herb, as a um, herb that stimulates um, the lymphatic system that clears lymphatic congestion. Um, yes, then you can go online and read, well, it doesn't do anything based upon its estrogenic activity or they've been having trouble finding how, how it works when that's not, it has nothing to do with its traditional use at all. Absolutely. And part of the problem is that in, med in traditional medicine studies, things like pharmaceutical drugs, they have an idea, this drug works in this way, so we will study how it works. So when they go to look at herbs, they go in with the same mindset. Well, this herb has this ingredient. It has estrogen. So this means it must work in this way. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily true because as in the case of red clover, one of the benefits is really for detoxification. But that detoxification effect is not coming from its estrogen. So if you're going into a study thinking, okay, I have to look for the active ingredient. What's the most, what's most likely the active ingredient in the syrup? You would pick up on the phytoestrogen because that appears to be so important. And then you would start putting out all these warnings. Well, this has the phytoestrogen, which we think is the active ingredient. So therefore, we think it's dangerous for women with breast cancer and endometriosis. But in a reality, before you know it, you have we think, we think, we think, and there's no actual research, there's no actual what we know. And that's part of the problem with doing studies with a double-blind placebo model because they're based for very allopathic drugs. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other discussion if you could do some time about problems with these double-blind studies and how um, they can't look at the whole thing. Uh, but, yeah, any, it seems like any herb that has some phytoestrogens in it, you can start getting warnings that this is potentially dangerous um, when it's not as long as someone takes it in a responsible way. Um, the same thing with licorice, where you'll get warnings that it has estrogens in it and it's going to do all these things based upon the estrogens, which is not going to happen as long as you can, someone takes it as they should. If someone takes red clover or licorice or some of the herb with phytoestrogens and starts um, taking down tablespoons of tincture of it, well, um, they might have, though you'll get side effects if you take enough of anything, but that, at that point you're really straying away from any type of traditional or, or responsible use. Absolutely. And that's the basis for basically any herb, is you have to use it responsibly. You have to use it according to the traditional use. You can't go out and say, oh, I'm feeling a little tired. Let me take massive doses of um, echin um, echinacea, um, <laughs> things like rhodiola, things like licorice, and take massive doses of them along with things like caffeine. Because if you do that, you will have side effects. 
But if you use them the way they're intended, they'll slowly help to build the body up. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we should go down on on our list. We have some other things uh, underused. We have 5-HTP. Um, you want to get into that? 5-HTP is very good for a lot of things. One of the things that it's most known for is depression. And people seem to have this fear of using 5-HTP for the depression, especially if they're on all these medications. And they, they tell me, well, my doctor said I can't take it because I'll get something called serotonin syndrome. Serotonin is this illness, I put it in quotes, that if you take the building box to serotonin, like 5-HTP, and you take an SSRI, which blocks the breakdown, of serotonin, you'll build up too much serotonin in the brain and you'll go crazy. And that's really, if you think about it logically, it's really not true because you're basically, okay, you stop the breakdown of serotonin with the medication. So slowly the serotonin you have will last longer, but you're not giving the, the body the building blocks to build more of it. So how is it going to be making all this massive amounts of serotonin? What, there's probably a reason why you were low in serotonin in the first place. So while you work to figure out the diet, the lifestyle, and all those things, you can take the 5-HTP to help give the body the building blocks that it needs so that it can start to actually build up the serotonin. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing with 5-HTP and serotonin syndrome, it's one of those things that you'll read a lot about online, but kind of in the real world, I know a, a lot of practitioners are giving 5-HTP to patients who have who are on antidepressants, and there's not a lot of you know, concern about it. it. It really is one of these um, theoretical dangers, and also like the 5-HTP is getting stopped with you know, kind of with this warning that it can lead to serotonin syndrome. The thing that leads to serotonin syndrome is, is antidepressant medication, the medications that mess around with um, serotonin when they don't know exactly how these medications work. 5-HTP um, does not lead to serotonin syndrome, and um, you know, I would be much more afraid about messing around with the um, psychiatric drugs. And it's one of these ironic things is that you can have someone taking or, or some cocktail of SSRIs or other psych drugs without a lot of concern while they were being put on it. But then in the process of trying to help the body and get off, that's where all the fear comes in that uh, an amino acid is going to create serotonin syndrome. Absolutely. And really, it mostly all comes from a theory. I believe I read somewhere that there hadn't been any reported cases of serotonin syndrome. It's just this theory that, well, this is how this works, and this is how this works. So if we put this and this together, then this is the result. But no one has actually gone out and seen, well, is that actually the case? It's one of those syndromes of, well, we see that 5-HTP can build into serotonin. We know that we're stopping the breakdown of serotonin. So if you take 5-HTP with an SSRI, all of a sudden you'll build up massive amounts of serotonin and get this hypothetical serotonin syndrome. That's what we think is happening. But there's no, we know for certain this is what happens. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another big theme of this. A lot of times in health, um, you'll hear theories, and they are really put forward as if they're a scientific fact when it, it really is nothing more than just a theory. And, and somehow the way it's, it, I mean, to me, the way it is that something in health, whether you're talking about natural or conventional, is passed off as scientific is not to um, demonstrate it by any standards, but as long as someone can put it in fancy terms and claim that they know some biochemical pathway, then suddenly it's passed off as scientific, um, e even though they could just be um, theorizing and making stuff up. 5-HTP uh, is one of the most um, commonly sold um, supplements that there is. Um, this has been around for a long time. There are millions and millions of people who have taken it. If this caused serotonin syndrome, 
um, there would be cases of it. And the, the fact that we don't have cases of 5-HCP causing serotonin syndrome, um, that, that's really pointing to um, its safety because it really is commonly used, sometimes not used very well, but um, people will take it for depression and insomnia. Absolutely. Something similar to 5-HTP, which has also kind of gotten a bad name, is SAMI. People are afraid to take SAMI. They think that it's going to interact with all of their medications. They think that it's going to cause all these side effects. But in reality, it is perfectly fine to take and can help with mood. It can help with energy. It can help with a lot of different things. Yeah, let's see. What else do we have? We have a couple more minutes. We have four minutes left. Uh, if there's, I don't know, anything else you want to go over, like in the amino acid realm, or, well. Um, you know, I think that, did we cover glandulars last time? We, we do not. Because I see a lot of people, they come in, and they have very low thyroid function. They have, or they have very severe adrenal fatigue. And then I suggest that they take things like adrenal or thyroid. And a lot of people have this fear that if you take adrenal glandular, either you're going, oh, some people have suggested they're going to get mad cow disease if they take an adrenal, or they're going to get, they're going to get addicted and then their body won't be able to make hormones anymore. And that's really not true. If you're severely adrenally fatigued and you can barely get up in the morning, something like an adrenal complex that includes glandulars is very, very helpful because it gives the body basically what it needs to function while you work on what's going on. Because part of why people get so frustrated is that they don't want to wait for results. So they give up on treating the inner body, treating the diet and lifestyle. So this, something like an adrenal gland can really give you a boost of energy now to help you see you through the long haul. And it's not going to give you mad cow disease. I'm not really sure where that comes from, this idea that just because you're taking glandulars, you'll get some sort of weird animal infection. Uh, well, you know, glandulars have been in use for like 100 years or so, and we, we don't have reports of people getting mad cow disease. You know, like one company, I don't use them much, but like Standard Process has been putting out certain like glandular products for like the same ones for like 80 years. Um, if these sort of things are producing mad cow disease, um, you think after 80 years there would be some reports or some signs of it. And um, but there are none, and also these do not work by replacing hormones. They're actually um, helping the glands function. Um, so people might think that they're like hormone replacement or something like that when they really are not. Absolutely. If you are on Synthroid, you can't just take the standard process thyroid formula and expect it to work the same way as Synthroid. There's just no way. Because there's not hormone. There's not yeah, but, enough of what you need. Yeah, but the glandulars do other things that, like, Synthroid won't do. So um, they're not interchangeable. And um, they, they, like, the standard process one, thyrotropin PMG, that will help protect the thyroid against an autoimmune assault, whereas Synthroid won't. But, but thyrotropin PMG is not going to give you more thyroid hormone. Well, we should wrap it up because we have 50 seconds left. Okay. Well, I think that we'll be doing another show probably next week about another interesting topic. So this is pretty much wrapped up, I think, at this point. So it'll be a brand new topic. Yeah. And maybe we'll go into like some more depth upon some of these um, things that we we're kind of getting into, but uh, we can talk a lot more about things like uh, evidence-based medicine or the way um, um, supplements work. There's, there's a lot of things to get into. Anyway, um, that's it. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Bye.